goes, Psst, what would you do with a million dollars? That the FBI had a video camera in a hotel room where the state senator got handed $50,000 in cash to give the contract to the other guy. And in that same year, I went to McDonald's and they looked at me like I was from Mars. So you have to break out of that matrix. Write me a check for $3 million. Excuse me? Uh, I don't have a penny. Oh, the best way to get me to do something is tell me I can't do it. I have enough money to cure cancer, but what good would that do? If your product isn't in the filter, you don't exist. So our guest today is Jay Samet, an entrepreneur, digital inno innovator, best-selling author, and a professional disruptor. Yep. He's been working with brands like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Sony, EMI, and many more. In the 90s, he helped the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, to gain internet access for schools nationwide. Welcome to the proud country of Lithuania, Jay. Pleasure to be here. Welcome, Jay. I have read your book, uh, Disrupt Yourself. It is uh, now translated to Lithuanian language. And uh, it is, a, I, in my opinion, it is a very important uh, book for entrepreneurs and for even future generations. Uh, in this book, you talk about this, uh, speed to fail. In your opinion, uh, when you got an idea in your head, you have to kill it as fast as possible. Absolutely. Just like to test if uh, that idea is worth it. So, the, yeah, so sorry. The biggest mistake that some entrepreneurs will make is they'll go to family and friends that tell them, oh, this is good, oh, this is good, when what you're really doing is wasting that person's time. When somebody comes to me with their business idea, my job is to tell you why it's the worst idea in the world. Because if you can find the flaws and the holes in your thing before you start spending money, yeah. then all the iterations are up here. And then when you find an idea that can't be killed, I call it a zombie idea, like the living dead, if it can't be killed, then raise money. Then, Because otherwise, you're going to find these problems out there. So if you can do more of it earlier. So one of the first things you want to do is find customers, people that will be willing to pay money for your idea, because they're going to be your hardest critics, because you're wasting their time and their money. Yeah. Um, and so... Basic. My question is, have you ever regretted about killing your idea a few years ago or maybe a decade ago? A decade ago? Oh, um, I've had lists of ideas and, and, you know, as an entrepreneur with a startup company, and sometimes I didn't put the right one at the top of the list. In the early days, uh, I was on the internet before the web. I was on the internet from 78. I'm old. Um, but we had a bunch of different ideas and Number three on the list was the thing that we came up with called digital mailbox. I could write something on my computer and send it to you and you could read it on your computer. Basically, email. We had this idea for email. It didn't make the top of the list. Wow, <laughs> that's unbelievable. What year was that, 78? Uh, it, was, it was early, yeah. You'd be a billionaire, right? I'm doing okay. The next question is, uh, Jake Welch once said that uh, change before you have to. Can you remember at least one time when you realized you don't catch up with something? For example, technologies and etc. Oh, where I fell behind? Yeah. Yeah, so um, in the English version of the book, Reid Hoffman wrote the intro. He created PayPal and LinkedIn. He's now on the board of Microsoft, the smartest guy. And he was the first check to Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook. He, his track record of success is unparalleled. And he came to me with this idea that he was putting money into, did I want to put money in, where people would come and stay at my house or I would stay at their house and I'm never doing that. And so I turned down being the first investor in Airbnb. Um, what I realized is it's not about me. I'm not in the center demographic anymore. Um, so yeah, there's many times. What happens even to the best of us is we calcify. We, we, we get habits that we work on autopilot and we're not the inquisitive child that we started out. We accept so many of the frustrations in life as that's the way it is, as opposed to questioning, why is it that way? Isn't there something new that's changed that I can solve this problem with? And that's where you see the great innovation. You don't have to be 
a rocket scientist and invent the cell phone. It's already out there. You don't have to invent these pieces of technology. And that was my big breakthrough in my life is I saw these companies that spent millions of dollars making something and then it didn't hit the market that they thought, so they just abandoned it. And I'd go, if you take that thing over here and you put it over there, um, you know, uh, Gutenberg, we learned this lie that, you know, he invented the printing press, you know, just out of his mind. Yeah. Not true. What happened was he was working with the type, but 500 years ago, somebody took an olive press that you make olive oil and said, if we make a bigger one, we can crush grapes and we don't have to do this. Suddenly, everybody in Germany was making Rieslings. There were so many vineyards 500 years ago that made more wine than they make today that they all went bankrupt. They all went out of business. So now there's all these presses sitting around and Gutenberg's like, I think I got a better use for that. And that's where innovation comes from. So many things that we use today weren't set out for the purpose that we use them. So that's called disruption. Yeah. Some kind of. Coming back to your case with the Airbnb, you're some kind of, remember me, the Shaquille O'Neal. Have you heard that the situation when uh, he was asked to invest to a coffee shop and he said, nah, black people don't drink coffees and the company was Starbucks? Yeah. He lost a lot of money. But you know who has the number one highest grossing Starbucks? Magic Johnson. The black guy. In, uh, in so Miami. they do drink coffee. Um, yeah, so you're not going to pick everything right. And, and this book isn't about me being right. This book is every 48 hours, every two days, there's another self-made billionaire. What do you do the past two days? I mean, we're all a bunch of slackers. And they're getting younger and younger, you know? Uh, Kylie Jenner, billionaire at 20. Now, you could say, well, she came from a famous family. Nobody else in her family is a billionaire. So what are these people doing differently? And so when I realized that dozens of these people that I worked with have all become billionaires, and they're not any different, but they looked at the world differently. And that can be taught. You only need two things for success insight and perseverance. I cannot teach perseverance, but insight can be taught. And insight is where this all comes from. And I kind of trick people into reading the book because it'll make them wealthy, which is true. But the real reason is because those same skill sets can solve the existential problems. Climate change, scarcity of food, healthcare, income inequality. All of these things can be changed using the same process of first changing yourself because everybody thinks of changing the world but nobody thinks of changing themselves. And once you can change that voice in your head, take off those blinders, once you see that you can change who you are, changing everything else is easy. I mean, I grew up as a dyslexic kid. I was in the stupid reading group. And when you're a little kid, you know you're in the stupid group. And life isn't so good. But something in me made me break out of that mold. And what I realized later in life is having dyslexia was my superpower. Because I could connect the dots differently. And because as a child, I couldn't do certain things that other kids did, I would delegate those things. So if it's a group project, you know, you read it and da 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 and I'll talk about it, right? And that's the definition of management. Have somebody else do the work and take all the credit. Um, so if you can change that voice that says you're not good at math, you probably think that because in third grade you missed seven times eight. You know it now, right? We spend so much of our time putting ourselves in a box and our teachers and our parents do it to us because they want to protect us from failing. Failing is so important. There's not a child walking that didn't fall down first. So failure is giving up. Failing is learning what doesn't work. And so many of the tech apps that you use every day were things 
that failed at what they set out to do, but pivoted and became something else. I would like to talk to you now about the stock market and economics okay. uh, for a bit. Uh, since 2009 recession, we're having a really good time. So we're living more than a decade quite good. Companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google are worth more than a trillion dollars each. In your book, Disrupt Yourself, you say that thousands of millionaires and dozens of billionaires get rich by selling their unprofitable company stocks for the potential of being industry giants. Do you think that the next econo economic crash will happen because of an unrealistic company's price? Ah. The stock market goes up and down. The other thing you have to realize is the value of money constantly changes. But what an entrepreneur does is create money from thin air. Most people were raised with this, either you have the money or I have the money okay, that it's a zero-sum game thing. There's $100 and somebody's going to get it. But if I start a company and I sell you half of the company for $100, now I have a company worth $200. I've made an extra 100 yeah. And when the next guy comes along and we now sell it 1% for $1,000, I've now made a million dollars out of nowhere. And that's what happens. Are some companies overvalued at times? Sure, they'll be disrupted by the next wave of companies. But that's not, there's not this fake bubble that's going to come crashing. What you're seeing now, and probably a different way of framing your question, is what Silicon Valley realized is that they would back monopolies. If you put enough money behind Uber, where they can lose $2 billion a quarter, yeah. why am I gonna back your company that's gonna compete with them? So Uber will then own the world. Microsoft will own the world, Apple will own the world. And that's why you see these trillion dollar companies because we're all one click away from six billion people. So if you create something new, so they don't always have the next idea. Microsoft didn't see the internet coming. Google didn't invent their advertising model. Okay, but they have enough capital and are lean enough to move that they can buy something. You know, the last company uh, of mine that was acquired uh, was acquired for $200 million and the company had never made a penny in profit and probably never will. But it had the potential to unlock a new market for the acquirer and the other reason that people overpay for startups, and I've been a CEO of a public NASDAQ company. When you're a CEO, you don't care about anything except that quarterly race that you're on. What are your numbers for that quarter, the next quarter? You're not planning the future, you're not, you're not thinking about, that's your job. So if I would have a bunch of engineers working to invent a new thing, and that's costing me money quarter after quarter, I'll get fired. But if I go and pay way too much for something, I don't get fired for that. So CEOs want to buy the R&D that they're not doing anymore. Big companies aren't inventing their future. They're acquiring it. Now let's talk about the digital pirates. In Eastern Europe, in Lithuania, we still have some problem with uh, stealing content, music, movies, and so on. Imagine the situation if you would be hired to solve this problem. What would you do? So the problem is still pretty universal. And uh, I used to run the world's largest music company. Believe me, I know what it's like when you have to lay off 35,000 people. Um, the, the way that it ended up being solved is in the first years of around the year 2000, when Napster was the big thing, I looked at the data. And there was something that shocked me that I didn't expect. So it's the first year of Napster. Everybody steals every song. They've got all the 20th century music. So by the next year, the amount of stealing should go down, but it didn't. So we started looking and the same person would steal the same song over and over again. Why? Because they knew it was available in the cloud somewhere and it was easier to find it there than to figure out where they had it which means people didn't want to own content anymore. They wanted to rent. They wanted access to it. So the model of the iTunes store of let me buy that song for 99 cents went away 
and the Spotify model or the Netflix model was give me access to content. And in a world of diminishing resources, most of what we spend our money on is digital. The majority of your paycheck goes for things that aren't real. Rent isn't physical. Mortgage isn't physical. Student loans aren't physical. Insurance. Music isn't physical. Insurance isn't physical. And now we start getting into books aren't physical. You know, there's e-books. And, and so you start realizing that the subscription model is how you deal with piracy. Who are the pioneers of subscription? Spotify? Right. So Spotify, Netflix is a subscription. The CD or digital movies? You're, you're, you're getting them all, you know, onto your devices. Uh, now, where we're going next that, that solves piracy is today we spend four to ten hours a day staring at this. Yeah. Three years from now, this will not come out of your pocket. Instead, you'll have glasses with heads-up display. And the information <coughs> won't be you Googling to find information. The universe will conspire to bring the information to you when and where you need it. I have a self-driving car. It drives me around. It's safer. It's a better driver than I am. Now imagine a world where it knows I haven't stopped for lunch. I eat at McDonald's three times a week. There's McDonald's 1,600 feet ahead on the freeway. And up pops, would you like a free French fry? And you say yes, and the car drives, and you then buy there. That's where we're going to, where the sales and marketing is truncated into that moment. And AI systems will help predict what we want and enhance our lives. Do you think it's good or bad? We won't have any choice, right? No. Um, well, we can have the discussion of, you know, fate versus choice, and, and, and that's a, a different philosophical. But no, I think it's absolutely the greatest thing. And I also think that everybody that's fighting for privacy doesn't understand the concept. If you believe that your medical record should be private, you're basically saying you want your fellow citizens of Lithuania to die younger than citizens of other countries. Because I don't share my data? Because, yes. If we all look at all the genomes and can see what interacts with what and what drug works for this and what food works and, and take the data set of 11 billion people, which will be real soon, and be able to know predictively what will work for you and prevent you from getting cancer, this, that, and the other thing, isn't it kind of selfish to say? And the other thing is, there is no privacy. When I've talked in front of the EU on this topic, they don't want this company to have it or this company. So, well, what about your government? Oh, yeah, well, you know, we get to have it. Well, I trust entrepreneurs a lot more than I trust leaders of, of governments because entrepreneurs have to earn their customers every day. They break that trust, the company disappears. Governments have ways of mandating trust. Once in four or five years, that's it? If ever. Yeah. And my last question would be, what do you think is going to happen the next big disruption in like 10 years or 20 years in the future? What area? So there's a bunch of them. So augmented reality, I'm as bullish as can be, and I can tell you a, m a million new businesses, though, too. But as far as disruption that people aren't prepared for, um, when you start talking about quantum computing, it means that somebody will make a machine that is so much faster than everybody else's machine that there are no more security codes or encryption, that's gone. But that also means no banking system works. No stock market can exist, okay? You have huge, huge issues when everything that we build our society goes completely digital, and now there's a way for one person with one machine to throw a monkey wrench. So that's one big issue. The other big issue that we're facing is our population is still growing. And places that used to be able to grow food won't be able to. And we have technologies coming on board that will solve for some of it, but won't solve for it equally. And there will be many nations that can't grow enough food to sustain themselves. And last time I checked, if you're in a place where you can't eat, you leave. So we're going to see over the next 20 years, right now we have more 
refugees globally than after World War II. And we're going to see this number continue to grow. So unless we use technology to really start addressing these major issues, um, it'll be, you know, scary times. On the positive, we now have solar glass and solar paint and energy will basically be as free as it always used to be. You know, no one ever charged you for the sun. Every piece of energy we use is just sun being stored in coal or sun being stored in dead plants that make oil. So now we're going to talk about if you don't have energy as a restriction, what abundance can we share across the world? Um, you know, capitalism has lowered global poverty, extended people's lives, have made the world better. Is it perfect? No. Is anything going to be perfect? No. But we now have a way to get any idea to its audience without friction. Anybody can get access to millions of dollars of capital with no gatekeepers in between. And one of the advantages and one of the reasons why I'm excited that the book is here in Lithuania is you now have an advantage in Lithuania over the US, over China, over Russia. How is that? When you start talking about all the new things that will be capable with 5G, edge computing, heads-up display, continuous, always-on uh, information, that's going to generate the next generation of businesses and, and services. Well, to roll out 5G in the U.S. will take years and tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. To have all of Vilnius on 5G, give me 15 minutes and, and one antenna. So now, this is what I've been working with the government of Singapore. This is what Singapore realized. They could be the incubator for how this stuff goes. I mean, Tokyo was the first place where everybody had phones and, and started using information on phones instead of talking on phones. Uh, it was a commuter culture of, of getting information for the trains. So that's where all your emojis came from. There were quick ways to get things on the screen to tell people the weather. So what can be innovated in Lithuania that'll change the course of history for the world? That's an exciting time to be. You have the education, you have the infrastructure. Now you just need to encourage people to not be afraid of failing. By the way, we've got uh, the fastest internet, I believe, for five years, maybe 10 years in the whole world. Yeah. It's really, really fast. And yet you've only had one unicorn company. So what's it about the culture? And I don't know the culture, so I'm not going to sit as an outsider and go, your are But I will tell you the only advantage the U.S. has. Educational system, I don't think we're in the top 100, okay? Capital, everybody has capital, okay? Americans have no fear of failure. There's no embarrassment of failing. It's more embarrassing not to try. And so that can do, let's see how it goes. Uh, is Simpsons is translated into Lithuanian? Simpsons yeah, of course, cartoon? of course. Okay, so Homer comes up with a get rich quick idea and what happens? It blows up and then life goes on. That's an attitude that cultures need to embrace in an era of endless innovation or otherwise you fall behind. So your internet is faster than your culture was prepared for. That's a great uh, human trait, I think, Jay. Now, are there any other key human traits you think that, um, that enable someone to thrive, you know, and not only survive? Are there key traits in, in people you've worked with in yourself that you've um, identified that you know, allow for this creativity to, uh, to get unlocked? Well. We all have mirrors in our houses, but we really don't tend to look at ourselves, honestly. So what are we bad at? We have to surround ourselves with people that have complementary skills. In most jobs and interviewing, you try to hire somebody like you, and you end up with a mini-me, right? You don't end up with somebody that has a, a, a different approach and a different way. And so if you look historically, all the innovation over the past thousand years. Think of uh, uh, along the Silk Road. 
it all happened at intersections of different cultures where different ideas came together and clashed and said, oh, you've got this, I could use that for this. Oh, you've got these great fireworks so we can make a cannon. Um, so you have to be open and realize you're not going to be the best at everything and try to backfill. Try to make sure that you're the dumbest person in your company. Um, and that's probably you know, uh, a key part. The other is, let's take ego out of as many decisions as possible. And it used to be the senior most person said, we're gonna do this, this is the new product. Is Nowadays, you can A-B test anything. You can find data on almost anything you wanna do. And data doesn't lie, data doesn't have an ego, data should be at every meeting. Um, I don't know if Victoria's Secret was a chain here in Europe. Uh, um, it's women's, known. <laughs> women's lingerie. So uh, I had a client that wanted to take them on and go head to head. They figured out how to make a supply chain that could get the same stuff cheaper, da da da. But they wanted a Hollywood spokeswoman for it. Who do you pick? Somebody wanted an actress that was, you know, curvy, somebody wanted one that was young, somebody wanted one old, you know, married, you know, divorced 10 times, like, how do you know? Well, without any permission, you make up a fake ad of each one of these people and you just put it up on the internet and you see the click-through rate and you'll instantly know which one and now you have data. Now you can go to the Hollywood agencies and they pitch this one, this one and go, I can't afford that, I can't afford that. And they go, well, do you have anybody else? And when they get to the person you really want, you're getting them for cheap. And you say, who else does this? Netflix doesn't tell anybody making movies how many people watched it on Netflix. So if the series is, my, my son is, is, is a TV writer, they don't know if your show's a hit or not. Because if it's a hit, you're going to ask for more money. So data, it's all about the data. So identifying the data is a, is a key human trait yes. and looking at it. Okay. And what do you think are the main obstacles in preventing from someone seeing that opportunity? Now, sometimes it's there, but what, what is it that you know, prevents people from? I think I think most people were told what they can't do. And they internalize that in, in their life somehow. You're not good enough, you can't do this, you can't do that. And that stops them from trying. Uh, most people give up too soon and I, and I tell people, go to an old age home and ask the people there what do they regret most in their lives. And not one of them will talk about a mistake. What they'll regret is that they were afraid to try. They wanted to be a musician. They wanted to travel. They wanted to do something, but they never got around to it. And the biggest mistake you can make is making no mistake. I mean, so many people go and want to get the big company job and work for that big Fortune 500 company. That Fortune 500 company is not going to be there. One day you're going to wake up and they're gone. You know, the original Fortune 500 companies, less than 10% are still around. So there is no security. So the security robs the ambition? Not true. It's the illusion of security. So you have to break out of that matrix. We're all living in our self-made matrix of this is the way it is, this is the way it operates this way. And yet when you look at the people that you admire, that change the world, it's that musician that said, yeah, I'm going to just make the kind of music I like. Everybody tells me, you know, there was somebody that told the Beatles that, you know, that kind of music was over and, and turned them down. I mean, best-selling authors, though, their books were turned down. I mean, but they believed in themselves and they didn't give up. So keep on doing it. And you'll know when to change, not because somebody says it, but because the data will tell you what to change and not a personal opinion of someone. Now, I remember a story where you had this uh, Lotus selling kiosk all made up and you said you've, you maxed your credit cards, you were sure you were getting the business, you were getting the contract, I think it was for, for California? Yeah, so, um, back when lotteries were coming all over the US, each state was getting their own lottery and whatever, and going back, again, I'm old, um, computers used to be a little black screen with little green type, so this other company had a machine for the lottery where you type in your numbers and the little numbers come on the screen and you get your ticket. 
I had a six foot tall kiosk. There was a full color screen with video. It said in six different languages, touch me. And then a video would come up in your language and tell you and show you the cars and everything. And it had a motion detector. So if you're walking by in the market, it goes, Psst, what would you do with a million dollars? Right, and you look around, All right? And I was in my early 20s. I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't know much about business. I maxed out my credit cards, built this. And now I'm up in the capital of our state, me versus this other stupid machine. I'm going to be so rich. Life is great. I am the smartest guy in the room. And the other guy got the contract. Now, later I would find out, after a lot of tears, that the FBI had a video camera in a hotel room where the state senator got handed $50,000 in cash to give the contract to the other guy. But even after that came out and the senator went to prison, the other guy still got to keep the contract. I kid you not. So now, I have now couldn't understand in that moment, I didn't know the backstory. How could I be so wrong? That piece of crap. And now I'm flying back to LA. And if you haven't been to LA, we have no public transportation system, okay? I'm flying back. I do not have enough money. I've maxed out all my cars to take a cab home. There is no Uber back then, okay? And I don't know how to get a bus. No one's ever taken a bus in LA. They they're, don't exist. And there used to be these little old ladies that sat at information counters to tell tourists what to do, but it's it's nighttime. They're all closed. I I'm don't know how I'm going to get home. I've got two little boys to feed. I'm I, my life's over. And it dawns on me. My kiosk could tell you how to get around town. My kiosk could talk in all these different languages. My kiosk could print out boarding passes, da da da. So I pivoted. Today, when you walk through an airport, you're not talking to anybody, you're not dealing with anybody. It's a kiosk. And in that same year, I went to McDonald's and said, the, the drive through window, I like, you know, you never got the right order. Why not have a touchscreen kiosk that you can order your stuff? And they looked at me like I was from Mars. In the U.S. today, you go into McDonald's because they raise minimum wage. Minimum wage being raised doesn't benefit the worker. It means management now has a better incentive to invest in equipment that can do the same thing that a human could have. So now you touch your own screen, you make your own order, and they eliminate more jobs. So what do you think was the, a lot of people going back on that plane, they would think, oh, it's a failure, it's not fair, you know, they would have all those emotions and, and that would be, that's it. What, what made you look at the situation differently, do you think? You know, what was the value driving that, that instead of see, seeing that as a failure, you, you got this idea, well, I can just use it in, you know, in the airport as a kiosk? I'm guessing I was wired that way. But I had two small children to feed. I wanted them to have a better life than I did. I grew up you know, regular like everybody else. And I didn't have a choice. So when your back's against the wall, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, you find a way out of it. I, I, I tell another story in, 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 in the book that, that uh, I did this giant deal with McDonald's to do a promotion. And this is like, you know, I report to the chairman of Sony. This is like, what a great job, this is going to be big. You buy Big Mac, you get a free song, right, to compete against Apple, right? Big Mac, uh, free track. And it's all going done, it's, it's about to be announced. And then McDonald's tells me, you know, the night before, you know, in case too many people redeem, and it would cost a ton of money if everybody redeemed, we buy insurance, and you have to pick up half of this, so write me a check for $3 million. Excuse me? Uh, I don't have a penny. I don't have $3 million, and I just told the board and how great this is and everything, I'm going to get fired. My job's over. It's the same situation. So break it down. The problem wasn't $3 million. The problem was McDonald's wanted insurance. So I went back to McDonald's and said, we're Sony. We'll insure the contest. You write me a check for $3 million. So then I went to the board and said, we haven't launched yet, but I'm already $3 million in profit on the new business. So when that problem hit you, Jay, so what do you think was the, what was again the thing in you that said? I cannot fail. I cannot give up. There has to be a better answer.
So not taking no right. for an answer. Oh, the best way to get me to do something is tell me I can't do it. That, that motivates me like, like nothing else. So what's up with that? What was, did someone in school told you you can't do something? Was it some of your peers, your teachers? My grandfather when, 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 never went past the second grade. And when I got into college, he said, would you just do me one thing? And I love my grandfather dearly. And he said, would you write an article for the school paper and send it to me? I go, sure. I had no desire to be a writer. And I went in and, you know, so they said, okay. And turned in my first article and I said, this is horrible. You can't write. Don't come back. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Fast forward. I wrote more stories for the number one college paper that anybody in the history of the paper became an editor, you know, to, all because somebody said no. I said, okay, I will learn because I just don't take no. So people told you you can't do things and, and so that became a... so when someone tells you no, the only thing that they're telling you is that you can't do it with them. Not that you can't do it. You'll find somebody else. And then the second thing that took me 10 years to learn is I used to have these good ideas like telling McDonald's they should have kiosks or whatever. And you come out of the meeting and you go, they don't get it. Why don't they get it? I don't understand how they don't get it. I was with one of the biggest corporations in the world pitching something and the CEO's secretary used a typewriter. I'm going like, okay, they're not going to understand any of this. And I just left, they don't get it. They don't, guess what? They're already in the corner suite. They're already CEO. It's not their job to get it. It's your job to explain the future in a way that somebody living the past will understand and embrace. And the second I switched it around, that I'm not solving for this company, I'm solving for you. What motivates you? What would get you to take a meeting, all right? I mean, I, I tried to get work with the biggest auto company and I'm again 20 something years old, I know nothing about cars, I know nobody in Detroit, but I knew I was right, that I could save them $600 million. How am I going to get a meeting? Like, this is impossible. Who would that executive want to meet? It's America, it's apple pie, it's football, it's, you know, football. So I looked and there's a football coach from Michigan State, the university, near Detroit that just retired, called him up, said, you're my new head of sales. He doesn't know anything about computers. Not a problem. We'd go into the meeting, they'd talk about this game from this year and that year and throw in the thing and da da da. Then sooner or later they go, why is the kid here? Yeah. Okay, give him the business. Easy as that. And uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you tons of those shortcuts. So, so actually finding a way that you could bring value to the person right. in what they understand was the key yeah. realization for you. That sounds a little bit like, uh, a little bit like magic. And I've, I've, I think I've read somewhere that you, uh, you had a, a bit of a magician's career uh, at, at a point in life, or, or was it a hobby? No, so I, I started magic as a little kid and, and never stopped. I paid my way through college. Um, there's a uh, club in Los Angeles called the Magic Castle for magicians around the world. I'm a, performing member, um, um, you know, it's, it's what I love. Uh, and what I learned uh, is that it's the greatest hobby for going into business. And here's the why. You, you like musicians and music? Yes. When you go to a concert, you want to hear them sing their best, play their best, right? When you want to see a dancer, you want to see them dance their best. When you go to see a ma magician, you want to see him screw up. Absolutely. The audience is against the performer. If you can win over that room where everybody's against you, going into a boardroom is easy. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. So do you, think there's, um, do you think there's similarities between a great musician and a great entrepreneur? Um, yeah, so if you go back... Uh, a century ago, Robert Houdin, uh, a French magician. Um, magicians and scientists, there was no difference. You know, what, what is science to the educated is magic to the uneducated. And there's a great story that Robert Houdin uh, was, was French and the, the French were colonizing North Africa and there was an uprising and they wanted to find a way to end this war. 
So they asked if he would come down. And he went down there and he has a 10-year-old boy with him with a little bag and 10-year-old boy puts it on the stage and the magician opens it, takes a rag and goes on the, the biggest, strongest warrior that the Maraboots had and then says, I'm going to now take away all your soldier strength. He asks the soldier to pick up the bag and he's, he can't lift it. Well, bag has a metal bottom stage. He knew about electromagnetic back then and could flip it on and off, but this is, you know, 100 years ago when nobody knew about electricity. And then he had said, give me your best marksman. Load the musket. I want him to shoot it right at me. And he shoots it, blood all over him. He takes the rag again, wipes. There's no bullet hole. When he loaded the musket, he put in a, a wax bullet filled with sheep's blood instead of a metal one. And they surrendered, right? So it's all communicating. It's all changing a mindset. And we're all in this mindset of limits. I wrote Disrupt You to take those blinders off. It is so amazing the letters I get from all over the world of people who've changed their lives, their family lives, their community. You know, you, you invent something that helps 10 people, you're popular. You invent something that helps a million people, you're rich. You do something that impacts a billion people, you change history. And uh, through the interview, you were mentioning, you know, you had many difficulties throughout your life and you, and you came out on top, and at least some of them. What do you think were the top three challenges in your life, and how did they serve you? Top three? Um, being dyslexic, which we talked about, you know, reading coming hard to me, made me feel inferior and different, and, 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 and when I then masked it and compensated around it, I developed other skills that made me stronger. Um, I, I learned in writing this book, my editor said, said to me, you're very competitive. I said, no, I'm not. I don't play sports. And I think because I went to school earlier than I should have, my mom forged my birth certificate. She wanted me out of the house. So I was the, the weakest kid, the smallest kid. So I had to find a way to compete in some other way. So that motivated me. Um, and then there's the greatest motivator in the world is being broke. You know, when you have them coming to your house to shut off your electricity, when they're coming to take your car, when, you know, you're, you know that there's nothing lower than that. So there's no risk that you can't take. And that to me turned out to be the greatest gift because there's no fear of the unknown. Been there, done that. It's not so bad, All right? And and so many people just won't take that first step. And a lot of the success stories that you hear about, the first step they didn't take voluntarily. They got fired. Mike Bloomberg, who's running for president of the United States, got fired. So he started his own company. Um, there was a kid about two, three years ago, or maybe four years ago now that applied for a job at Facebook, and they didn't hire him. So he went and created WhatsApp, and they bought it for him and made him a multi-billionaire in less than two years later. You know, so there's always another door. There's always another day. You know, if you wake up and you're breathing, everything else is up to you. Don't waste your future dwelling on the past. Just move forward. So you're saying in a way that failure is a very necessary step. Oh, absolutely. There, there's, there's, remember the movie Back to the Future? Doc Brown has the flux capacitor sitting on the toilet and fully formed. That's how people think inventors work. No. You know, they keep on failing until they fail their way to success. You know? Edison tried a thousand things before he had a light bulb that worked. I mean, it's over and over. Um, one of my favorite ones is when online dating became a big thing. Three guys came up with this idea. Instead of still pictures, we're going to have videos. So you can see their voice, their personality. We're going to make a fortune. It was called Tune and Hook Up. It was going to change the world. They were counting their money. Site goes up. 
Nobody wanted to date the losers that were on that site. You can't program around that, okay? It's not going to work. But they looked at the data, and the data told them something that they didn't have in their business plan. They watch videos. Nobody wanted to date that loser, but everybody wanted to show all their friends that loser's video. So they changed the name of Tuna and the Hookup to YouTube, and they became billionaires without any revenue. And this happens over and over again. I'm not telling the stories, and I have stories over hundreds of years in the book. I'm not telling the outlier stories, the freak things. I'm just telling you that everything that you've learned in life was done by somebody that was stubborn. This country was created by somebody that was stubborn. All right? The world changes because of people who are stubborn. And it's a lot of fun. That's the message. And I'm, I'm just wondering, imagine, Jay, if, if you had 48 hours to live. Usually they ask you if, you know, if you have 24 hours. I think it's, that's not enough. Now, if you would have 48 hours left to live on this planet, and we never know, that might be the case, actually. You know, after saying your goodbyes to loved ones, um, what else would you do? It's really one of those questions that is lame. No offense. Because you're really just going to spend that time with your loved ones because you're not going to impact the world. But I do feel that I have less days ahead of me than behind me. And when I was trying to say to myself, what did I learn in my life? What, what can I share? What impact can I make? Why was I here? And if I wasn't here to make the world better than I found it, then I've wasted my time. Being a parent can be making the world better. But I realized that I saw a path. And so with whatever time I do have left, because I don't know how many days, and we're now in the middle of February when we're doing this, uh, since January 1st, I've been in four continents and nine countries. I'm on a mission to make the journey easier for the next generation of entrepreneurs because the pace of change is much faster. And governments take 20 years to change. Um, the, the things that made us feel safe before and comfortable are disappearing. And many people will not adapt to this change. Half of all jobs will disappear this decade. And it happened 100 years ago. 100 years ago, half the people lived on farms, half lived on cities. Irrigation and the tractor, and now 2% of the people make food for 98%. But look at it a different way. Half the farmers lost their jobs. You know, almost all the farmers, half the people. But they were absorbed by the Industrial Revolution. So somebody could sit in a factory all day and do some repetitive motion. Anything that can be mechanized will be. So number one job in the United States is driving a vehicle. Truck drivers, I have a self-driving car. It wins, right? Self-driving shipping, you know, self-driving trucks. The new Volvo self-driving truck doesn't even have a cab. It's just a flat little thing, okay? And that goes to deliveries and drones and da 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 So most people are going to lose their livelihood. What do you do? Best thing I can do is show people that they have a choice. Disruption isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to what happens to you. You always have a choice. And uh, thank you for highlighting that. I think, um, I think that's the key difference between animals and humans. We can choose how we respond um, if we're wise enough in that moment. And thank you very much for not only producing this brilliant book in, in English, that was which the original language, but also um, you know, not putting any obstacles in place to make sure it's available in local language now also. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. That was a great thank interview and a lot of insight. Thank you guys for taking the time and helping me spread the word. I'm sorry, Jay, but I got two more quick, quick okay. questions. The first one is, who do you think is the biggest disruptor in the wor world's history? In the world's history? Yeah. The first guy that looked at a chicken and said, whatever comes out of his ass, I'm going to eat next. Um, no. Um, in the history, that's a tough one. Um, 
I, I, I'm, disruption isn't always necessarily a good thing. Yeah. I guess whoever the first person was that invented religion. Um, wow. Really? I probably had more impact on history than anything else. Um, good, In a bad, bad way? Good, bad, or indifferent. You know, you can make your own judgment. We're talking about impact. Um, but I'd say in business today, uh, you know, Elon Musk is tackling amazing issues. Uh, you know, Bill Gates was interesting when, when Bill retired. You know, you're the richest man in the world. There's not a lot of things to motivate you. But somebody went to him and said, is that what you want your legacy to be? You know, he's a doer. He's, he's very competitive. How would you like to be the first person in history to eradicate a disease off the planet? Nice sale. Hook, that hook was in, and he's spent billions, but it's not just the billions that he spent. That's what people miss. It's to solve that. How do you get a vaccine that has to be refrigerated out to places where there's no electricity? So all of the new things that are being invented to solve that, right? Most of the world does not have access to clean water and the toilet. How do you solve that, right? So you're seeing some amazing things, you know, uh, and, you know, when I first met Elon, uh, he sat me down and, and he said, I have enough money to cure cancer, but what good would that do? And I was like, whoa, where's this conversation go? Much deeper. Life on this planet's going to be over. We don't have a plan B. Now, you could say he's crazy. But what technologies to help us on this planet will come out of the pursuit of colonizing Mars? Um, one of the ones that uh, a professor that I worked with came up with was a large scale 3D printer gantry so that you can build housing on a foreign planet or after a monsoon or hurricane or earthquake, you don't need any skilled labor. You just need somebody to pour concrete in to the printer and it prints a house a day, or scale it up. So there's a lot of disruptors. I mean, I'm curious if to throw back, who do you think single most had the most impact on history? I believe a guy who invented the wheel. I, I think the, the, the wheel gets too much credit. Really? Yeah, it, you know. We used to carry things before that with our own hands. Um, but we had pack animals without a wheel. So we had pack animals carrying stuff. North American, Native Americans and South American, the Mayans built giant, giant things. The Aztecs built giant, giant things. They had round circles, but they never had a wheel. So. That's a kind of a wheel, I guess. No, but they never made a cart because th there were no animals to pull a cart. They had killed all of them when they were hunter gatherers. So. The wheel didn't really, you know, have the impact, you know, you know, metal, you know, that's pretty cool, you know, cavemen drank beer, you know, so th there's a lot of, a lot of different stuff, but, uh, you know, tough to go, go backwards, but, you know, in our lives right now, you know, we're seeing, you know, the internet fundamentally changed everyone's life on the planet. No, no, no question about it. In one lifetime. I've gotten to see three revolutions in one lifetime. Got to be day one in the internet, you know, the nutcase standing out here, the world came to where I was. I wasn't smart, I was just at UCLA and they had the internet starting in 78 so we could talk to other universities so that professors could figure out how to build better bombs to kill people. That's where the internet came out of. Um, then the PC revolution. I still remember my first laptop was, you know, 20 plus kilos. I'm like, it'll never be smaller than this. I am so cool, lucky. <laughs> um, then the mobile revolution, you know, totally exceeded everyone's expectations. You know, in the first year of the iPhone, people forget, two of the top 10 apps was a fart app and a game, okay? People couldn't come up with, with you know, any of the businesses that we think of today. Right? 
So it's not the people that invent the hardware. It's the people that say, I have a problem, this hardware can solve it. And now augmented reality, I can't tell you how much that changes things. And I'll give you the example that people don't think of. People can visualize adding stuff. But augmented reality also subtracts things. So you're in the supermarket and there's all those products, 40,000 products. You don't order all those products, you don't eat all those products. And each one was designed by somebody where the packaging pops out and you know, you can't find anything. Now you walk in and say, I just want things that are on Kato. Or I just want things that are halal or I want what Oprah talked about or whatever it might be and everything else disappears. Oh, here's the wines. What's the wine that I had Tuesday over at Frank's house? Boom, right? All these different things. My doctor tells me I can't have sugar. Are you gonna read every package? Show me the things that don't have sugar or that are good for low cholesterol. So now, if your product isn't in the filter, you don't exist. So the battle that I'm seeing between my biggest clients, the big tech guys, the giant tech guys, over who's going to control that, each one will spend $100 billion over the next couple of years. And you know what? It's no different than the iPhone. They're all thinking about the big thing. One of my clients has contact lenses that work now. Hits up the, it's witchcraft, okay? Other ones that I've played with, I can't describe because I'm under NDAs and stuff, but they beam stuff into the back of your eyeball. I mean, it is like HD TV, I mean, it's flawless. But they're, they're spending their money trying to own this piece of real estate, not what you're doing with it. You know, what is the new app that makes life better, that connects us, that empowers us, right? Who can we serve that wasn't served before? Like one of the toughest things you may face in a family is taking away car keys from an older relative. I had to do it to my uncle after he smashed it into a bus. But that ended his world. He couldn't go out on his own. He ended his whole thing. Self-driving car. Old people want to have that freedom. And cheaper insurance. Okay. Well, that was the Lon's latest innovation when you go, how smart is this guy? He knows how fast I drive, how often I drive, how often I speed, he knows everything. So he, off, he started an insurance company. He knows exactly what the car is doing. And he can say, if you never drive over 85, you pay this. You know, okay, well today I'm going over 85, it's gonna go up, <laughs> right? So it's data. It, it, it's, it's a fascinating time and, and I get to, get to meet some of the brightest people in the world. I'm, I'm just an average moron but I get to hang around with the really smart guys. But I'm telling everybody watching this, a trillion dollars is being spent in this new world and none of those people are solving the everyday things that you know that you could solve. Do you have to be in New York to solve this stuff? Do you have to be in Silicon Valley or in China? No. You'd be right here in Vilnius. I've seen it happen too many times to know that it's not a fallacy. It's a fact. And the last one. Uh, imagine the situation if you could uh, just meet or call anyone in the world, any person, one person, dead or alive, who would you call and why? Okay, um, I've actually thought about this one first. Um, <laughs> Harry Houdini. Um, as a magician, what people don't understand about early days of magic, because I'm obsessed with this, is they invented popular culture and advertising and all of that. Because if you were a singer, unless you sung Lithuanian, you're not singing here 100 years ago, to her, unless you spoke Russian, no, no, no. You know, um, everything was localized. But here's an elephant, now it's gone. That plays everywhere. So magicians were the first ones to navigate the world touring, to play everywhere, to play in front of kings and everything, to figure out how to get attention for what they were doing to you know, hang naked in Victorian times in front of a newspaper building and escape from a straitjacket, knowing that the newspaper was gonna come out, take that picture and, you know. So I just wanted to know what drove him. Because it was so unique to invent that as the idea of mass entertainment. I mean, you know, uh, I know how the rock concert came to be, 
You know, I know how all these others, but that, that, that for me is my, my personal stuff. Living, I'm now blessed with there's nobody that I don't get to call. Um, and the shocks are when people that you really look up to is like, oh my God, they have all the answers. And you get a phone call from them. I'm like, like somebody pretending to be that person. Like, uh, you know, why does the Pope need my help? I mean, uh, fascinating to live in a world where we're so connected. And, you know, I hope I inspire people. And I hope when they have that journey, they email me and tell me about it because that, that gets me to go and fly another 20,000 miles next week and you know, keep on going. Thank you for your time. I think the information from your lips was just brilliant and it's, it suits Lithuanians perfectly. I hope you'll have a good time in Lithuania for the next two, two or three days, right? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.